The dance also spurred Cage to make his music completely independent of whatever it was supposed to accompany, uh, which would become a signature Cajun trait and a radical aspect of his future On the practical side, it cleared the stage of instruments, making way for the dance. Um, but for Cage, it also meant that, as he said, quote unquote, the piano had become, in effect, a whole percussion orchestra under the control of one single player. The dance also spurred Cage to make his music completely independent of whatever it was supposed to accompany, uh, which would become a signature Cajun trait and a radical aspect of his future collaborative work with Cunningham. So Cunningham, and he, he would be on the stage totally independent. Cunningham would be, do the dance and Cage would do the music and it, they only brought those two things together when they finally got on stage, not beforehand. So that was a sort of very radical dimension in this early stage. Cage moved to New York in 1942. The mid-40s were an important period for him and for the development of his music. The Perilous Night, which is a prepared piano piece, was dramatic and emotional. It was made at, at, at the time when Cage was separating from his wife, Zinnia. Um, and it taught him he, that, that self-expression in music was futile since he discovered that the audience weren't grasping his meaning. So he, he sort of said about this piece, Perilous Night, it was, about, it was about the pain when love becomes troubled and all this, and he had all this emotion in it. It's a very intense piece of prepared piano music. And he just, all these reviews in the newspaper and everything, he realised that no one got that message. So he decided, why would you bother putting all your emotions, your private emotions, into music? So this was a big, important turning point when he saw that the audience wasn't getting it. Seeking a way out of composing emotionally expressive music, Cage began in 1946 to study Hindu aesthetics. His Sonatas and Interludes, uh, opus for prepared piano, is the result of that watershed change in Cage's approach. Based on the nine permanent emotions of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the sonatas and interludes deployed a universal emotion. So all these nine permanent emotions were like envy, joy, you know, like the sort of, I mean, in the West in the Bible, it's the seven deadly sins or something, right? So you have all these like extreme emotions of the spectrum of humanity, and that was like a universal emotion rather than a personal one. So these universal emotions helped him avoid self-expression. By this time, Cage had become increasingly precise in specifying the preparations for the piano, including the size of the bolts and all the other items, their distance from the bridge of the piano, and the specific Steinway model to which they applied. So actually, with the exhibition, we've always tried to get a Steinway, to be very cagey. Um, So, John Cage met the French expatriate, expatriate artist Marcel Duchamp in 1942, as soon as he moved to New York. Um, when Cage comes to New York, he first start, stays with Peggy Guggenheim, and uh, Duchamp is a good friend of hers. She's married to Max Ernst at the time, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, artists coming around, and, and this is sort of Cage's introduction to a very early art circle. Um, Duchamp, of course, was the pioneer of chance in the 20th century. Perceiving handmade, the handmade and the unilateral position of conventional authorship as futile, if not hubristic, in an age of mechanical reproduction and industrial mass production, Duchamp rejected painting to create works of art that would complete themselves, as he said, in various radical ways. Through the use of chance, and uh, the authorial role operative in Duchamp's work became the Im um, implacable questioning of all conventions. So you have a selection of works here of Duchamp's chance works. Um, as you probably know, Duchamp invents the ready-made in 1913-14. This is just a sort of reference. It's, um, <coughs> Hayden will use that in very complicated ways later, which we can discuss if you're interested in the question and answer moment. But these other works are classic Duchampian models of chance. 
At the bottom you have the three standard stoppages. I don't know if you know that work, but um, the original's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, what, what Duchamp did is he, he got three pieces of string a metre long. He called this his joke on the metre. Of course, with any great artist, you don't have jokes. You have, I mean, there's always some sort of much more serious point to it. As you know, the metres and metrics sort of this great French invention. There's actually apparently somewhere you can go and see a metre in France and say, wow, that's a metre. You know, it's this gold bar under a light or something. So Duchamp was sort of taking the seriousness out of the pride of the French in the metre. So he said, this is my joke on the metre. It happens at the time of the beginning of World War I. So it's a sort of slightly pre-data, but it's a gesture against all these certainties which has led to war and which the Dadas will end up protesting against. So he gets three metres of string, holds them up a metre from the ground and drops them. Okay, now what happens then is he drops it and it's on the ground and so it's sort of in a swirl like that. So it's, it's not straight anymore, but it's still a metre. So then he glues the, the string to a piece of canvas and therefore he's redefined the metre. Okay, and so then he has to make a new ruler for the new metre. Um, and so he's got three new instances of the metre. Now when asked about this work and, you know, someone said, well, how did you make that work? He said, I'm not the author of this work, the author is Chance. So when you sort of contrast this to sort of the, you know, big ego artist thing, big Picasso signature or something like that, or um, all these sort of much more egocentric figures in, in the history of modern art, saying I have no authorship, the author is Chance, is a pretty extraordinary thing to say in 1914. So Duchamp's like far ahead of the others. And then he does other works, which maybe I'll read something about. Um, so, as if continuing the experiment without feeling the need to make a signed work, Duchamp creates uh, shadows on the walls of his New York studio, uh, which allowed him to contemplate the fundamentally virtual and conceptual status of the creative act. His élevage de poussière, dust breeding on the large glass. I don't know if you know the work by Duchamp, the large glass. Uh, so I'm going like that because now it's flat. <laughs> it should be like that. Um, so he makes this grand work, or it's um, in English, the bride strip there by her bachelor's even. It's a big, large glass piece. It's now in the Philadelphia Museum. Duchamp had it lying horizontal in his apartment for three months and had gathered dust. And he decided that was a fascinating work in and of itself. So he had Man Ray photograph it. And so this is called Dust Breathing on the Large Glass. So all of these works are things that, models that are going to be taken up when, for instance, Rauschenberg and Cage get together in the 50s. But in the 20s, no, no one understood what Duchamp was doing at all. So in 1949, just as Cage was developing the silences and the time structures beyond his prepared piano works, he met a brilliant pianist named David Tudor. For Cage, so-called silence was never empty. It simply meant the opposite to composed sounds, as he said. There is no such thing as an empty space or an empty time. As his studies of East and South Asian philosophy deepened, he learned that the terms to express his celebration of all that can happen in this space, not dominated by authorial intentionality. This newly coherent theoretical position was presented at the Artists' Club in New York, and it was called his Lecture on Nothing, 1950. In the same year, the composer Christian Wolff gave Cage a newly published copy of the I Ching, Book of Changes. Um, at this time, Cage was turning his composing towards ways of letting sounds appear freely within the spaces he'd constructed with his time brackets, while working on his score called Concerto for Prepared Piano and Chamber Orchestra, 1950 to 51.